Hi, and welcome to the presentation. Um, my name is Dave Kyle. Uh, I'm the founder of PA Flyfish. If you're not familiar with the website, I know some people may not know the website. It is a, uh, a forum primarily, but also a uh, community of anglers in the Pennsylvania region that share a lot of what we're doing, where we go, what we do. And uh, we've been around for 25 years. And you can be found very simply at paflyfish.com. And this evening, I'm uh, happy to have with me uh, David Weaver. And David is uh, one of the moderators on the site who I've known for quite a long time. And um, I'd say David is extremely knowledgeable on uh, warm water fishing, fly fishing specifically, and uh, has written a lot of blog posts on the site about the, the topic. And um, I was trying to get him to get involved with this a little bit earlier in the year, but I think he was a little bit, had a little bit of Zoom fatigue from... Uh, <laughs> all his presentations he was doing for, for his work um, at the university he's, he's at. So um, what I'd like to do is I'm gonna make a switch on the screen over to David's screen and uh, let him get started while we're doing that. David, do you wanna do a quick introduction with yourself more than I've done already? Sure, thanks, uh, thanks Dave. Yeah, I, I'm Dave, Dave and Dave are running the show tonight. He's the other Dave. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm a, I've been a moderator on PA Flyfish for uh, over a decade now. And uh, we have our kind of informal group, uh, the Warm Water Insurgents, uh, where we troll the trout snobs and uh, remind people on a regular basis that there are other places and other species uh, that you can fish for in Pennsylvania uh, besides uh, the little spotted sissy fish, uh, as we sometimes like to call them. So without any further uh, 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 introductions, we're just going to go jump right into this. Um, I think our plan here, David, is to, um, this should probably not even be a half hour presentation, but we're going to also provide time for questions. And I'll look in a couple of different ways. There's a chat area that you'll have, I'll have access to, and I'll bring that up so I can see um, what that may be in the form of a chat that someone may want to put in there for us, as well as at the end, if someone wants to just verbally kind of jump in, we can unmute you or unmute yourself and, and talk to David and um, share some things. I know, like as Paul mentioned, I know we also have Rick uh, as well, who knows a lot about uh, some of this topic. So I think as a, as a community, it's good for us to share uh, even beyond what David's sharing as well. So um, David, do you want to tell us what you're going to focus on today? Uh, sure, this will be about uh, 30 minutes. Uh, we're going to focus on fishing small streams, creeks, basically, for warm water species in Pennsylvania. Um, Dave or Paul, could you just give me a thumbs up and verify that you can see this slide? Okay, all right, we, we, should, we should be good to go. So uh, all these photos were taken by me in the last uh, 30 days. Uh, the uh, image there is uh, one of my uh, paintings. Um, this, uh, this image you see right here is typical of what we're going to be focusing on with respect to conditions and size of uh, small streams for warm water species. I've been doing this really since I was a kid. I, I think a lot of people started out by fishing the, the little warm water creek in their neighborhood or maybe back behind the house or something as they've moved on to fly fishing. They've uh, gravitated to trout fishing or you know salt water or river bass fishing and they've, they've forgotten what a good time they had uh, with that little creek behind the house or that on the back side of the farm. And uh, so we're going to try to revisit some of that uh, uh, memory for, for, for some of you. Okay. The rationale for this, why small warm water streams? I, I like to call it thinking outside the trout box. Um, fly fishing is immensely popular these days, as you know, and oftentimes when people come into fly fishing now, they, they have the, the trout mentality. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I love trout fishing too. We're a, a, a trout fishing community on PA fly fish. Um, but I often like to remind people to think outside the trout box, as I, as I like to put it. Um, there are other species available uh, to fish. They're, they're an absolute blast. They're particularly good for beginners. This kind of game that we're talking about tonight is a, a great way for a, a newbie fly fisherman to just practice casting and catching fish. 
Uh, I, we see this on PA fly fish in the summertime. People are grumbling about how the rivers are too warm and, well, we're going to have to wait till September, you know, before we can go fishing again. And I just, you know, I'm just like, come on, guys. You know, there, there's other other species that you can fish for uh, uh, besides trout. And this is a really good way to introduce beginners uh, 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 to fly fishing as well. It's easy and it's fun. Uh, not all fish have to be challenging to catch. Again, it's great for beginners. Uh, oftentimes I hear about beginners taking up fly fishing and they talk about going up and fishing slate run or falling springs or, or the yawk or they can't catch anything. And, and, I, and once again, I, I tend to think, you know, you, you don't want to jump into the major leagues uh, when you're a beginning fly fisherman. Stay away from slate run and the yawk and go to that local stream at the back of the farm and fish for sunfish. Trust me, you'll have a blast. You'll probably find me there too. Uh, there's an abundant number of places. Uh, this is a summer game. This is a seasonal game. We'll talk more about that, but there, there are streams all over Pennsylvania, particularly in a lot of the areas that are that are uh, that get have, have limited trout fishing opportunities, western Pennsylvania and, and southeastern Pennsylvania, where, where many of us in our community live uh, and where trout fishing pickings can be kind of slim, particularly in the summertime. Uh, a lot of places to go. Very few of these get hardly any angling pressure at all. They do get some. Uh, the kid uh, in the inner tube in the summer with his dog, you'll see them out there fishing. But many of these streams, uh, I've literally, I've been fishing them for decades. I've literally never seen another fisherman or, or even any evidence that they're being fished. Now, some of them, there's fishing line. Uh, we'll talk about how to look for some of that. But many of these streams don't get any fishing pressure at all. Uh, so if you're if you're frustrated with the big crowds at Penn's Creek, uh, maybe maybe you ought to go downstream, you know, 15 or 20 miles. You probably won't find anybody and catch bass and have a great time. So lack of angling pressure, a lot of places, and it's easy and fun. Now this um, some of these slides might be. Um, this. Okay, you can price, maybe see it a little bit better right there. Um, these are the four species that, that, that are really what the game is about. A uh, smallmouth bass, rock bass, uh, red breast sunfish, and green sunfish. Um, we'll talk about some of the other ones, but, but this, this is the primary game, and the red breast sunfish is the top of the pack on small creeks, in, in my opinion. And uh, so we'll start with the smallmouth, the bass, uh, the, the, the fish that most of you are familiar with. Uh, in small streams in Pennsylvania, most of the bass are typically smallmouths, no surprise there. Um, they, they, they're in the streams seasonally, with some exceptions that we'll, we'll look at uh, with spawning. Uh, but for most of the creeks that I fish and we're going to talk about, you're going to find smallmouth bass in these streams from about Labor Day until first, fro or I'm sorry, from Memorial Day, from late May until about first frost in October. You'll find these in most streams in Pennsylvania with suitable habitat. Uh, they top out at about 12 inches in these streams. Uh, keep in mind, these are slow growing fish. A, a, a foot long smallmouth in Pennsylvania is about five years old. A 15 incher in the Susquehanna River is probably eight. Uh, so the, these are slow growing fish. It takes a long time for them to reach this size. They do, they do get a little bit bigger in some of the creeks. Uh, I've never caught a four pound smallmouth in a small creek in Pennsylvania. I've seen some. Uh, this one here on the left, this vertical photo right here. I took that photo yesterday. That fish is 14 inches. Uh, you can see the 15 inch mark on my rod that was caught in a creek just yesterday, uh, 14 inches. That is a big smallmouth bass in the kind of streams that I, 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 I fish. But you'll find them all over. They're, uh, they're, they're uh, just a, as much fun to catch in small streams as they are in big rivers. I can't promise, Paul, that they'll pull as hard as they do in the yawk if you catch one in a little creek, but, but uh, they're, they're smallmouth bass. They're, you, you can count on them. They never quit. Uh, you hook a smallmouth bass, he'll fight you until, the, until you let him go, and he'll, he'll get in the last lick, even that little eight inch, or he'll splash you when you release them. These, these fish are wonderful. Um, rock bass are another uh, staple in small streams. I, I get a lot of them in, in creeks that feed into the Susquehanna River. As is often discussed on PA fly fish, there's a, there's a kind of a consensus that rock bass are not as numerous in Pennsylvania as they used to be. Uh, I don't have data on this. I've never seen electrofishing data on rock bass, but uh, in my opinion, they are scarcer than they used to be, particularly in the bigger rivers. Uh, they seem to be more numerous in small creeks. This is a photo I just I took just a few days ago. Uh, they top out at about eight inches. Most of them are a lot smaller than that. Uh, they tend to like slower areas of the river. 
Uh, often they like woody debris and and, uh, and, a, and a single big boulder. It, it's not uncommon to drift a woolly bugger or a nymph past a single boulder or a log, uh, and you can pull out 10 or 12 rock bass. They're all, you know, four or five inches long. Maybe one might come in at eight or nine. But, uh, but they're a fun fish. They're not as scrappy as small mouse. If you hook a rock bass, uh, they'll give you one or two good pulls. And then after that, they just go belly up and they, they let you pull them right in and unhook them. They're gentlemen, you know, they know when the gig is up and, and uh, there's no point making a scene and being fussy. They, they come in, come right up to hand, let you take them off the hook. Uh, they're a lot of fun. Uh, they're, de they're decent to eat if you like cooking fish, if you like a fish fry, uh, uh, like most pan fish, uh, they're, they're, they're decent to eat. The green sunfish, uh, this one here in the lower right, uh, is very common too. Um, they're almost too common and they're small. This, this one in this picture is probably about, uh, that I'm holding is probably about five inches. That, that tends to be about as big as they get. I caught one once, it was nine. Uh, other than that, I rarely see green sunfish in creeks much bigger than about six inches, but they're extremely numerous. In my experience, when, when you explore a new stream and you, you fish it for the first time, if you only catch green sunfish, that, that's not a good indication. Uh, it might be a I, I wouldn't write the creek off yet, but if you come back next year and you get the same result, it, it might not be the, a great stream because if, if it's loaded with green sunfish and nothing else, that, that's not a good sign. Uh, but they're extremely numerous, they're aggressive, they're easy for kids to catch, um, they're, they're, they'll hit big flies, uh, and they fight about as good as a rock bass. The red breast sunfish is the king of the bunch, in my opinion. I just love these species. Uh, they're common in, in uh, all the flowing areas of Pennsylvania. Occasionally you get them in lakes, uh, but they're more common in streams and rivers. They're a gorgeous fish. Uh, they top out at about eight inches. Um, they, they hit surface flies, they fight really hard, kind of like a large bluegill in a lake. They're a really sporty uh, fish. They're really pretty. Um, I, I tend to find them in, in small streams in the same places where you find smallmouth bass. Uh, you, they both like current, they like chunk rock. Um, they're often, I often see them side by side. In, as the streams get a little bit bigger, if you move into a mid-sized creek, or certainly this is true in rivers, uh, the red breast sunfish tend to be a, a, oriented on the banks. But uh, in the small kind of creeks that we're going to be talking about tonight, you'll find them right in mid-channel, right out there with the smallmouth bass. They're very aggressive. Um, they're, they're, they, they fight hard. Uh, a good place to look for them when you're scouting streams, and we'll talk more about this later, you want to check out bridges. And red breast sunfish are, are inclined to spawn. You'll see this in big rivers too. You'll see this in the Susquehanna. They like to spawn in the marl and sand gravel that piles up behind uh, bridge pilings. So whenever I'm scouting out a new stream in, in the summertime, I always go to the downstream sign and, and look below the bridge piling in that little sand uh, sediment uh, pile that forms behind the piling. Oftentimes you'll see a big fat red breast sunfish with a nest right there on the piling. That's a good sign. You know right away uh, that this is a stream that's got the fish that you're looking for. But you'll see them on reds well into mid late summer, uh, oftentimes right below a bridge piling. So what's, uh, so their, what's, their typical, what's their typical spawning time? Uh, basically June is, is kind of top, top time. You'll see them on reds usually later than bass. Uh, but you'll see them on reds in late May and June, but they're, they're still out on reds. I saw a bunch of them on reds just this morning and, you know, we're well into late July and I'm still seeing them, you know, spawning in small streams. So it's basically, a, you know, first half of the summer, even a little bit in the second half. There are other species that you can counter in small warm water creeks in Pennsylvania. Uh, one of the streams I frequent has a large number of largemouth bass. Uh, it's not uncommon to catch largemouth in, in little creeks in Pennsylvania. Like smallmouth, they tend to top out at about 12 or 13 inches in creeks, uh, but they're often very healthy. And for some reason, certain creeks tend to have them in, 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 in abundance. It's been my experience if the creek you're fishing has a low head dam or an impounded area downstream from where you are, it's much more likely that you're going to see um, largemouth bass uh, in, in, in the stream in, in, those, in those locations. Uh, again, they, they don't tend to like current as much, but if you've got a, a slow area or a pool, it's common to find some largemouths, often in, in groups. Uh, black crappies are pretty common in small creeks. Uh, I don't target crappies when I'm 
creek fishing, but they, they do show up from time to time. Again, if there's an impounded area, you can you can hit the mother load of crappies sometimes in the spring. But but for summertime fishing, when you're wet wading in these little creeks, it's unusual to get a crappie. I, I don't think I've ever caught a white crappie in a creek in Pennsylvania. Black crappies are fairly common. Once in a while, I'll get a yellow perch. Uh, I don't I don't target perch. They're pretty rare in my neck of the woods here in Adams County. But every once in a while, I'll, I'll get surprised and I'll catch a yellow perch. Uh, most of these creeks have bluegills, although they tend to be very small in creeks. And I, I don't regard bluegills as much sport in, in small creeks. It's not like lakes or farm ponds where you can have a blast catching big fat bluegills. And once in a while, I'll get a big one in a creek, but, but they tend to top out at about three or four inches. They just seem to stunt in creeks and they, they just don't get the mass on them that red breasts and uh, rock bass do. So I tend to, I tend, if I catch a bluegill or a couple of bluegills, there's often a swarm of them. Like green sunfish, they can just become kind of a nuisance and good time to move down to the next pool. Uh, bullheads are common in these creeks. Again, I don't target bullheads, but I, I get a couple on a fly every year. Uh, once in a while, I'll see a little brown bullhead swimming around. And sometimes if you put a fly in front of them, you can actually catch them. They'll, they'll bite a fly. Uh, so will channel catfish. Uh, the creeks I fish do not typically have channel catfish in them until they until you get to a bigger stream. Uh, the rivers are, are full of them and sometimes the tributary mouths are common, but I, I don't expect to see channel catfish in the, in the small creeks that I fish, but I do occasionally see them. One year I had an unusual experience uh, on a small creek that I, I fished for sunfish. Uh, there was a pool, it was a low period of time during a, a fairly dry period. And, and in this pool, there were probably uh, 50 or 60 channel cats all in the 25, 26 inch range, and they were all piled up in this pool waiting for the creek to rise so they could navigate up through this ripple and continue moving upstream. And I, I was able to catch some of them actually on a fly, but I only saw it that one year. I've never seen it since. Uh, that, that creek is in the Potomac watershed and the Potomac is very thick with channel cats, as many of you know. But, uh, but the creeks I fish for, are the habitat is just too skinny uh, to harbor very many channel cats. I've never caught a walleye in a small warm water creek in Pennsylvania. Uh, they do show up in surveys uh, on, on fish and boat. If you look at some of the surveys of some, some smaller creeks, the walleyes do occasionally show up. Uh, and some of the larger creeks that I fish, it would not surprise me to catch one. Um, but I, I don't, I don't target walleyes. Uh, I don't, I, they're just not numerous enough in the little creeks where I am. Uh, I do occasionally get a pickerel about once or twice a year. I'll catch a small pickerel. Uh, they're common and they're widespread. I wouldn't say they're common. They're widespread in Pennsylvania. They're common in some parts of the state. They're widespread, but they're not common in South Central Pennsylvania, but, but they do inhabit small creeks. It's not unusual to get one. Uh, in Western Pennsylvania, it wouldn't surprise me to get a small pike uh, out of a creek. And I, I wouldn't expect that in central Pennsylvania, uh, but in western Pennsylvania, some of the, some of the larger creeks, uh, it wouldn't surprise me to get a small pike. There are this, this, muskies too, Dave. Yeah, oh yeah, there's, yeah muskies are native to small creeks. Yeah, in western yeah. Pennsylvania, yeah. little creeks like Cuswago and, you know, lower end of Oil Creek. Some of those, some of those streams yeah. are known for, for having uh, essicids in them, pike and muskies where they're native. But uh, uh, every once in a while, I'll hear somebody talk about seeing a muskie in a little creek around here. And I, when I hear that, I usually assume that it's mistaken identity and they saw a chain pickerel. Um, but this, this is the game here. If you're, if you're prospecting small streams in Pennsylvania, uh, smallmouth bass, rock bass, and red breast sunfish, they're your friends. Uh, they're the ones that are gonna, you're gonna be focusing on most of the time. When you're scouting for streams uh, to fly fish for, for warm water species, you want, to look, you want to look for some characteristics here. These tend to be low gradient valley streams. Um, some of them, if, if they're really slow and they're soft bottom, I, I wouldn't bother fishing with them. For one thing, it's, it, it's going to be too hard to, to wade. And in my experience, very, very slow moving muddy bottom streams do not harbor very many fish. You want to look for hard bottom. You want to look for some current. Uh, chunk or ledge rock on the bottom is, is particularly good and woody debris in the pools. Now we'll look at some more examples of this, but if you're, if you're looking at a creek like this, 
or like this. That, that's a good sign. There's steady current. You can see a bubble trail through here, lots of woody debris, uh, hard rock bottom. Uh, you can wade right across this. Many of these creeks that you're going to fish have no water deeper than about two feet in the summer. Much of it is under a foot. Uh, so this, this is very shallow, skinny water fishing. But if it's got current and rocks and a little bit of cover, there's a good chance you're going to find the, the fish that we're, we're talking about. For scouting out and looking for places for warm water fishing. This is a game that's very similar to what you're used to doing with trout fishing. Uh, it starts with a, a map reconnaissance. Uh, just look at the typical area around your neck of the woods or where you're going to be visiting. Um, look for bridges. Most of these streams are, are in the valleys. They're not typically at high elevation. If they're streams that have uh, year-round wild trout populations in them, they're probably not very good for warm water species. On the other hand, if they're if they're approved trout waters that get warm in the summer where trout die off, they're often really good uh, warm water fisheries in the summertime. Many of the streams that I fish are actually uh, stock trout waters, or what we used to call approved trout waters that get too warm and their trout just, they're all gone. It's not uncommon to catch a hatch in early summer in some of these creeks. In fact, sometimes when I'm bass fishing, I'll take a creel with me in June, just in case I catch a hatchery trout, I'll, I'll whack him for dinner because he's not going to live much longer. But uh, you want to look for some of these valley areas uh, up on the up on the ridges and up in the state forests and whatnot. Uh, there's fewer opportunities. Most of these streams are down in the valleys. Uh, uh, many of them you drive over on your way to work. You, you'll see a little creek. Nobody ever fishes there because it's not a trout stream. Those are good places to stop. And the, the, the first thing to do in your travels, once, once you've identified you know, a, a stream that's interesting to you or that you're familiar with, uh, check at the bridge. Uh, be careful because most of these bridges don't have parking access. Uh, people don't typically fish these streams. Sometimes it's hard to find a place to park, but if you can pull off, often at the end of the guardrail, there's enough room for a car to drop in there. If, it, if these are country roads, uh, they, they don't tend to have a lot of traffic on them. Uh, you can walk out on the bridge with your polarized glasses and your, your binoculars. This is actually, I do this on big rivers all the time uh, to look for, for where fish are on, on bigger rivers, but it works for small creeks. When you walk up and you look down into that creek, you want to see something that looks like these pictures I've got right here. This, this is ideal. Uh, these are photos that I took just this morning. Uh, this is looking upstream. Uh, you recognize right away that it's got habitat, it's rock bottom, it's got current, it's got tree cover. Most of these creeks are a little bit cooler than our big rivers. Uh, the Susquehanna River will top out on a hot summer day with a water temperature in the upper 80s in the main channel. A lot of these creeks are a little smaller. They tend to top out at about 80 degrees because of the tree cover and occasionally from spring feeds. But uh, this is what you want to look for. This looks like a tiny little creek. A lot of fishermen would look at this and they'd write it off as just you know, not having anything in it. Uh, they don't know what they're missing. Good current, uh, riffle areas, rocks. Uh, on the other side of the bridge, looking downstream, you've got a big pool here. Uh, you can see there's rocks on the bottom. This pool is about two feet deep. Uh, I lingered on the bridge this morning after I took this photo. I could see red breast sunfish in this pool and I stopped counting at 20. And they were right in the middle of the channel. Many of them were cruising around. A couple of them were on reds uh, right in this pool just this morning, a matter of hours ago. Now, there's because these streams are not fished much, oftentimes the landowners are not accustomed to seeing fishermen. And you want to be kind of discreet about this. Uh, my personal policy is if the property is not posted, and I can get down to the water, I can park in an area that I think is, 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 is safe and, and uh, not disruptive, um, and I can get down to the water. If I don't see posted signs, I, I will quietly go down and, and fish the stream. Uh, I've only been told once in all the years I've been doing this, I've only ever once had a landowner ask me to leave an unposted section of stream, which I immediately complied with. Uh, more often, uh, you'll, you'll see uh, landowners occasionally, they'll be out on their tractor. I'll sometimes hit them up and talk to them. They're surprised that somebody's fishing their property. And uh, when, when, you, when you make contact with a landowner and they, they get that first impression that you're a, you know, you're a serious sportsman who respects their property and isn't going to litter and uh, they tend to be okay. I'll ask them if I see them, is it okay if I'm fishing here? And most of the time they will be like, oh yeah, that's fine. Um, but uh, if it's posted, obviously that's a different situation. Uh, some of these streams are posted, but they're posted because the landowners don't want dumping or they don't want 
people doe hunting or something like that. And if you knock on the door, a lot of times, they'll, again, if they meet you and they, they talk to you, a lot of these are old time landowners. So they're, they're amenable to letting the public on their property. Um, I always ask them, where should I put my car? I should point out what my vehicle looks like if I'm asking permission. And they're, they're usually pretty cool with that. But uh, because they're not used to seeing fishermen, sometimes it's kind of surprising to them uh, to see this. But if they get a chance to talk to you, they'll, 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 they'll usually be OK with it. If, if not, if it's posted or they ask you to leave, remember, there's a whole bunch of these other creeks uh, where you can go. Many of these creeks uh, dump into larger warm water rivers. Uh, if, you, if you're living in a county or fishing in a county that has one of the big rivers like the Susquehanna or the Delaware or the Allegheny or the Juniata going through it, a lot of these creeks are going to be targeting our tributaries and they're pretty small streams right where they go down to the, to the big river. And uh, I found that oftentimes uh, you can find a slightly larger class of bass in some of these creeks that are close to where they go into the big rivers. As many of you know, these smaller creeks are often spawning areas, particularly the, the, the mid-sized creeks. Uh, they're spawning areas uh, for, for, for river bass. They will move up into these streams. And I, I typically don't target those fish myself. Uh, but if you're, if you're out and about in, in uh, springtime, which is before the creek fishing season begins, you, you can find some, some large migratory bass moving into some of these creeks for, for, for spawning reasons. Um, again, stock trout streams are a good place to look. Uh, look at some of these stock trout streams. Uh, um, if they get warm in the summer, you, you can find pretty good sunfish and bass fishing in the section that's, that that is stocked actually, uh, oftentimes downstream. Some of the best small warm water creeks that I fish are, are, are downstream areas of stock trout waters. Again, most of these are in farmland and valleys. Uh, anything, if you're up in the hill, up in the Appalachians, uh, elevations of higher than, uh, you know, a thousand feet, it's, it's probably, you're probably in trout country. You're not going to find a whole lot of bass and sunfish. This, this is a lowland uh, ball game. Now, because these areas don't have regular parking and angler trails, one of the things you want to be aware of is, 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 being careful getting down to the stream. Uh, I've gotten a lot more careful and, and methodical about wading and stumbling around creeks as I've gotten older. I started wearing knee pads because I've, I've banged my knees up a few times. But uh, most of these creeks, when you find, when you check one of these places out and, and you, you, you found a creek under a bridge and you think you want to fish, uh, this is what you're likely to see. Uh, a pretty steep, uh, rugged approach down to the creek that nobody ever goes down. Um, many of these banks are just socked in with poison ivy and mile a minute weed. Uh, you don't want to go down in short pants. A lot of people think, well, geez, it's a little warm water creek. I'm going to fish it in short pants. If, you're, if you know that you can get to it in short pants, that, that's okay. But uh, most of these creeks are going to be busting tall grass. Uh, this is typical. Uh, June and July is peak vegetation along these creeks. Uh, you're going to see a lot more deer uh, than other fishermen. You're going to flush deer out of this creekside grass all the time. But this stuff is literally chest high. And you're going to have to bust brush to get down to a lot of these creeks. Most of them don't have trails. Uh, I always wear long, I prefer to wet wade small creeks, but I always wear long pants just to get through this stuff. I treat my wading pants with permethrin uh, tick a base clothing treatment. Uh, you can get covered with insects uh, in here, but just be aware of the, of the difficult access to a lot of these creeks and, and wear the appropriate clothing. Be careful going down these uh, hillsides. A, a couple of times I, I've, I've gone down on my butt and slid down these things and uh, you just want to be careful. A lot, a lot of these uh, hillsides have loose rock. This is a brand new bridge right here with, with with a, a shot rock in here. But a lot of these older bridges, there's a lot of loose rock and gravel under that vegetation. You have to be really careful. I recommend a wading staff and moving very slowly down uh, to get down to the creek. Now, I consider a small creek in Pennsylvania, a small warm water creek, is, is, a, is a waterway that doesn't possess these species of vegetation. If you're a bass fisherman, you know right away what these things are. This is willow grass and this is lizard grass. Uh, the, the bigger rivers in Pennsylvania, like the Susquehanna River or Juniata, are just filled with this stuff. Uh, the lizard grass grows along the bank. Uh, the willow grass typically uh, in shallow areas or mid-river uh, mid islands. 
Uh, when I start to see these plant species, uh, I tend to regard the stream as transitioning to what I think of as a medium sized stream, uh, probably a creek that's more like a, a, a 20 or 30 feet across with depths of up to two to three feet. When you start seeing this vegetation, you're probably in a creek that's big enough for people to navigate with canoes and kayaks or tubes. And uh, when I was out yesterday, I, even though it was a weekday, I saw quite a few yakkers and tubers, even though I was on a creek that was, I consider small. Um, but uh, this, this is, when I see this vegetation, to me, that's just kind of a cue that you're, you're in a stream that's transitioning to medium size. And I, I, I think of a, of a medium size or large creek as a stream like Swatera Creek or Conda de Gwinnett Creek or something like that. These are bigger waterways, uh, much better known. You know, you, 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 sometimes you'll see these plants further up, but in the creeks I fish, it's usually too skinny, too small for, for these plants, for what that's worth. Now, how low can they go? You'd be amazed where bass and sunfish will, will move in the summertime. Um, when there's a rainstorm in, in May or June, it, it, it's almost like a pump, and these species migrate up into these into these streams almost by capillary action. I, 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 that's, that's the way I think about uh, these fish getting sucked up into these little, um, uh, in some cases, literally first order ditches. You'd, you'd be amazed. Uh, some of these places aren't worth fishing, but you'd be surprised where you, you'll, you'll find bass and sunfish in, in Pennsylvania. And keep in mind, these are transient populations. These small creeks that we're talking about here uh, don't typically have uh, bass in them after about mid-October, about, uh, about first frost. Uh, they don't typically have very many warm water species before June. So the, 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 the main season for small warm water creeks is basically July through September. And this is prime time for fishing these little creeks. They're loaded with fish. Uh, this is a photo that I took this morning. Uh, this is a tiny little creek uh, near my home. Uh, this little riffle right here is about 20 inches across right now. You can literally go out there and step right across it. This creek will go uh, dry uh, during dry uh, warm periods of, of some summers, uh, like 2016. As I, right after I took this photo, right under this willow bush, I looked down, I was on a bridge. Uh, the water's about six inches deep. I could see several bass and sunfish swimming around. I don't know if you can see them in this photo, but there's a largemouth bass there. There's a largemouth bass here. There's a red breast sunfish here, and there's a painted turtle up there. They're all within a few feet of each other. And this bass right here is about about 11 inches long. He's thicker than my wrist. A very healthy fat fish. This photo was taken this morning in about six inches of water. Uh, you, these fish are in here and they'll stay in this in this creek uh, until until the fall. Then one day you'll come out in October and you won't see any of them. They just vanish very quickly uh, in the fall. Um, there's a lot of fish in here. Uh, a great blue heron would be uh, living large. Um, I don't know if you can see this picture here. I'm holding a tiny little green sunfish. I took this picture this morning also. Uh, if you're familiar with Gettysburg, that's a little round top in the background. And this little wet spot here, this is a, a, a little first order ditch that dries up in the summer called Plum Run. It's famously known in Civil War history as Bloody Run. Uh, but it, it literally, it's just a, a, a base. It doesn't have water in it for much of the heat of the summer. Uh, there's some beavers actually down here this year and have dammed it up. But there, there's a little hole here. This is a little frog puddle about five feet across. And I, 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 drew, I stopped there this morning. I had my trout rod strung up in the car with the beetle fly. So I just dropped the beetle right there in those lily pads. And on my first cast, I caught a green sunfish about four inches or three inches long right there. Uh, but this is literally a creek that's, that's this wide uh, when it's got water in it. Um, it dries up most summers, usually by August, there's just stagnant mud here. And yet it's full of sunfish. I've seen red breast sunfish up to seven inches long, and I've even seen some smallmouth bass in Plum Run. Again, this is a first order ditch that, that flows seasonally, and it will pull fish up into it. That, that's, that's how far up into these little creeks. And then, I mean, for heaven's sakes, don't come to Gettysburg to fish Plum Run. I'm not implying that. You're wasting your time. But, uh, but I, I put this up kind of for kicks and giggles and just sort of as a reminder of, of how skinny the water is that some of these bass and sunfish will move into. You'd really be surprised. 
Uh, gear and flies, you can use whatever you want. It's not, not sophisticated. Uh, I typically fish small warm water creeks with a seven weight, but I, I have a lot of small, tiny little three and four weight trout rods that are five feet long, and I often use them. Use whatever rod you want, doesn't matter. Use whatever flies you want, it doesn't matter. It has been my experience that if, if you're targeting sunfish, as I usually am, you're going to catch more fish subsurface. Um, red breast sunfish and rock bass will definitely plow topwater flies. I've, I've caught rock bass on muscalunge lures uh, fished on the surface. But generally speaking, if, if, you're, if you're fishing subsurface, you're going to get a lot more rockies and, and red breasts and quite a few smallmouths too. If you only want to catch the bass, stick with poppers. Uh, that'll, that'll cut a lot of the sunfish out. Only the biggest sunfish you'll get on, on typical size poppers. But this, this is my kind of my go-to rig. Uh, I like two nymphs. I use a big old strike indicator. It's one of these split cork bobbers that you can buy at, you know, Walmart or Dick Sporting Goods for spin fishermen. I like these. I use these on bigger rivers uh, as well for strike indicators. Uh, tip, it's about uh, 12 to 14 pound test line. Uh, there's no reason to use a light tippet. You, you're going to get snagged a lot, rip your flies out of the trees. Uh, the flies, keep them on the light side. This one has a, a dumbbell weight. Uh, remember, you're fishing in very small streams that don't have a lot of current and are very shallow. So tie your flies for these streams very lightweight. If you tie them too heavy, you're, they're just going to go right to the bottom and get caught in the rocks. So a lightweight nymph with a little bit of weight. And then I'll usually put a, another a dropper on behind it, maybe about 10 or 12 inches, usually eight pound test with a very small, uh, long nymph. I like my sunfish flies to have a long shank. Sunnies tend to take these flies pretty deep. Make sure you have your hemostats with you. If it's a long shank hook, you can reach right into that little green sunfish and get that uh, fly right out really quickly. But again, now this, this is kind of what I would be my go-to method. Most of the time you're going to catch smallmouth bass and rock bass on the larger nymph or woolly bugger, whatever it is you're using. The little trail nymph is going to get most of the sunfish, including most of the larger red breast sunfish. I'm not sure why this is. Red breasts have got a pretty big mouth, but they seem to be focused on eating smaller insects. Uh, rock bass and smallmouths prey predominant, uh, uh, predate predominantly on crayfish in these creeks, just as they do in the rivers. Uh, so these, if, you, if you don't want to catch the, the sunnies or you're being plagued with hordes of stunted bluegills and tiny little green sunfish, just cut off the, uh, the little fly and fish with the bigger one. That'll, that'll get you into some, into some bigger rock bass and, and, um, and uh, small mouse. Again, you can use any fly you want. Most of the time I, I throw poppers when I'm mainly targeting bass. But sunfish, and in my, people like to throw top water for sunfish, but it's been my experience that uh, a subsurface fly will, will, will get you a lot more rock bass and sunfish. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll fish upstream with a popper, make long casts uh, to target bass, and then on the way back, I'll, I'll swing these nymphs on the way back and, and slay the rock bass on the, on the back trip fishing below. So just to summarize, you should take up fishing small warm water streams for, for warm water species. There's a lot of them. Uh, do some uh, reconnaissance. Go find some of these things. Um, it's easy fishing. Uh, the prime time is right now until about September. If you've got some kids who like to play in a creek with a, with a Zebco spinning rod, bring them. Uh, if you've got a dog, bring the dog too. Um, go have a good time and splash around. You can catch a lot of these fish. They're a lot of fun. Uh, you don't have to wait until you know, the trout streams cool off for heaven's sakes. <laughs> There's a lot of other fishing opportunities in Pennsylvania. So small warm water streams, it, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, go, go find some of these places. You, you won't regret it. You'll catch a lot of fish. It's a lot of fun. So that concludes my presentation. Does anybody have any questions, thoughts, or, or comments? Feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. As far as poppers, Dave, do, do you ever fish poppers? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I fish poppers a lot. Uh, I like pencil poppers for bass. Um, that's also true on, on big rivers like the Juniata or the Potomac. Um, poppers work really well. Water like this, flat water like this uh, mm -hmm. is good, is ideal popper water. And again, that you tend to get a lot of bass. Uh, because the bass tend to be numerous and small uh, on these creeks, it's not uncommon to, to have a fish hit a popper, you miss it, and then you make one strip or one pop and another one piles onto it. 
uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. So yeah, I, I do use poppers a lot. There's a lot of bass fly fishermen. And that's all they fish in the summers, top water stuff. Yeah, yeah I do a good. lot of that. Yeah, yeah. Dave, yeah, so you have, have, okay. Go ahead. No, Dave, you have a picture of a crayfish up there. Uh -huh. um, do, you, do you use any crayfish patterns for any of this? Yeah, I do, but uh, this is unsophisticated fishing. I, I have a, some crayfish patterns that I'm very proud of that I use in the bigger rivers, but I tie them heavy. Uh, for fishing in, in deeper water around uh, 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 channel structure and in deep eddies in the pre-spawn period. I don't fish small creeks in the pre-spawn period because they don't have any bass in them. Pre-spawn bass fishing, for me at least, is a, is a big river ball game. So I, I, you can use crayfish flies. Uh, I, I am convinced that bass, smallmouth bass and rock bass in little creeks do feed primarily on on crayfish and some of the crayfish in the creek, some of the creeks in my neck of the woods have been colonized by rusty crayfish, uh, just as you'll see throughout much of central Pennsylvania. They don't all have them. This this section of creek here actually, I, I don't think has rusty crayfish. The crays are pretty scarce here, but uh, the creek I was on this morning, you take one step and you're flushing crayfish literally in, in hordes and every step you take and, and uh, uh, the, the rock bass and smallmouth do eat them. So yeah, that, that's why a woolly bug, bugger or any you know big rubber leg type nymph tends to work well. I think that's what the fish think they are. There's helgramites in these creeks too, although in my experience, helgramites are more common on the larger mm -hmm. small creeks and on the rivers. But you do find helgramites. Some of these creeks have hex, hexagenia. Uh, I do see some white flies uh, or various mayflies that are kind of like white flies that come off in the evenings. Um, one thing that I, I didn't mention that's nice about small warm water creek fishing is it's very good in the afternoon. A lot of times if you're bass fishing on, on a big river on a sunny, hot, muggy summer day, the fishing can be pretty good, but it really turns on when the sun sets. And uh, in my experience on small warm water creeks, you're, you're likely to find just as good a fishing at midday. You don't have, you don't have to wait till evening to, to get that, you know, happy popper bite like sometimes you have to do on, on the bigger rivers. Dave, is there a difference between you wanting to go to a small stream like this and a mid-sized stream? Is there any thoughts on when time of season, you know, when do you give up or when do you, when do you prefer going to a mid-sized stream? Yeah, um, mid, if, if it's a weekend, especially, especially this year with the increased number of people fishing and the vast increase in people canoeing and kayaking. Uh, if it's a weekend, I tend to want to stay away from the mid-size and larger creeks. Uh, they often fish well. If I'm going to go to one of those, I might go in the morning or evening. If I'm going to fish afternoon, I'll, I'll, I'll smaller creek because many of the small creeks I fish, they're, they're not even navigable in an inner tube. Uh, they're just too shallow this time of year, so there, there's less likely to be anybody else out there. Um, a lot of these valley creeks do muddy up pretty quick, uh, as you would imagine, just because of the environment that they're part of, and the smaller creeks uh, will often clear a little faster than the mid-size and larger creeks. Some of, some of the larger creeks, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll name drop Connor de Gwinnett, uh, that, that I consider that a small river or a very large creek. Those, those uh, waterways do have bass in them during the uh, the colder months of the year. Fish will winter over in those in those creeks. They're big enough, especially if there's a low head dam or a deep pool. But in the kind of little creeks I'm talking about in this presentation, there's almost no uh, wintering of fish. In fact, the bigger bass, in my experience, vacate the creeks earlier. They're usually gone in early October. Come back in, you know, the second half of the month, you might see some small small bass, uh, yearlings and two-year-olds. And then usually by the end of October, they're gone too. I have seen a couple of pools that were frozen over in the winter where I've seen bass in small creeks, but these, these were deep pools uh, associated with low head dams. Basically this game is up, you know, by mid-October. Any more questions? I have one. Yeah. This is great, Dave. I mean, this is really great. For, for me in Western Pennsylvania, what you're pre showing here, all these streams, it, it's 99% of the trout streams are, yeah. put in, are put in take. So they all hold, almost virtually all of them hold bass and most of them year round. And um, yeah, this is, this is great. Uh, Adam, I think you may have a question. 
Uh, yeah, I, I, I did. And I feel a little bad because I think it takes us a little bit away from the content of the presentation, but um, I find myself doing a lot of fill, still water fishing this time of year, uh, which I think intersects with your, your comments about kind of seasonality and, and certainly uh, depth. Um, and I'm wondering kind of what your experiences are with uh, still water, warm water fishing, and like particularly in terms of at, as things are getting hotter and hotter here, like how do you approach that in terms of, you know, depth in regards to temperature and, and uh, balancing that out? Yeah, if I was going to uh, be fishing uh, reservoirs and farm ponds this time of year, which, which is worth doing with a fly rod, uh, it's a little bit different. I, it, it's not likely to be as good in mid-afternoon. Uh, especially if it's a reservoir, if, it, if it's a big lake or reservoir and, and you're and you don't have a boat, let's say you're, you're a shore wading angler, you want to get out really early in the morning. Uh, a largemouth bass will patrol the, the, the shallows or sometimes literally cruising right along the bank of a reservoir like Raystown or something. But once that sun gets up, they are out. They are suspended out over deep water. And actually, so are the larger panfish. Uh, if you're looking for big bluegills or crappies, you know, you're, you almost need to go out with a boat with a sonar because they're going to be suspended over structure. It's, all, it's almost not a fly fishing game. We've talked about this on PA Fly Fish a few times. It can be done if you've got a boat with sonar and you, you, you know the lake and you've got a sinking line. You, you can get down 20, 25 feet and fish for suspended fish, but it's not, it's not a game that I do very much. It's a real specialty uh, ball game that you really need to put in your time to, to master. Now, farm ponds are a little bit different situation. Uh, like a lot of these creeks, the, the ponds are, are owned by farmers, but because, uh, because you can't access them at a bridge, you, you have to ask permission uh, to get in and fish that pond. Those are largemouth bass. You're not likely to get any smallies. Uh, some farm ponds have rock bass, but not very many. That's a largemouth bass and bluegill game. Uh, you're going to be fishing in weeds. Again, early morning and evening, hit the lily pads with something that looks to tie up some big weedless streamer flies and just smack them right into those lily pads in the morning or evening. Um, if you're in northeastern Pennsylvania, there's a lot of pickerel in ponds, but down here in this, and some of the lakes around here actually do have pickerel like Laurel Lake and Pine Grove Furnace or something, but, but mainly if you're fishing ponds and small lakes around here, it's a largemouth get largemouth bass game. And because a lot of them are shallow, the fish aren't deep like they are in reservoirs, but they're in dense cover. So you need weedless flies, uh, heavy tippets. I, I, would, I would go with a, a 20 pound tippet and a big weedless frog fly. Uh, but you, you can definitely catch bass in, in farm ponds. Poppers are good. A lot of these farm ponds are not fished very much and uh, they've got some big bass in them. Springtime is better. I, I, I rarely fly fish large lakes in the summer. I pretty much only do it in the spring uh, when, the, when the bluegills are bedding. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll fish these big lakes in the springtime, but this time of year, it, it's just the fish are too deep. Thank you, thanks. Any other questions? Well, I want to encourage us to continue the conversations at paflyfish.com if you haven't been there before. Um, again, it's a uh, forum and community of anglers. Uh, Dave Weaver's there is every day, uh, actually probably more <laughs> yeah, often than I am. I, I have no life, yeah. You're, you know where to find <laughs> me on the internet. Yeah, so it's, uh, and you have an opportunity, actually, if, if you've never really been on there, it's a great opportunity to catch up with some other people who are uh, sharing similar specific interests. And sometimes, it's, again, we're not just talking about typical trout fishing, but uh, this time of year, it's, and I do appreciate Dave for joining us and sharing us some specific aspects of, of this time of the season and some ideas about um, where we can go besides our, uh, our wishful thinking of Montana or other places this time of year. It sort of leaves us with a few options which are limited to some suggestions Dave's had, which is great. Um, Dave Weaver too, just so you know, uh, is a fantastic artist. And uh, if you haven't seen him, his artwork, I, I, I will, when I repost this uh, presentation, I'll make sure I share a link to some of his uh, work. You, you can find him on Instagram and I'll share a link with that. And you should follow him on Instagram if you're not already on that or know about his Instagram account. He uh, has some wonderful artwork and he, he shares some of his artwork at some of the uh, locations in the Southeast area that you can buy some of his work. So along with many talents and knowledge and and teachings. He's also a wonderful artist as well. So um, I want to thank uh, David very much for, for doing this this evening. And uh, 
I appreciate the uh, the information for me as well. Then didn't, didn't really think about some of these spots the way you described them. So uh, it gives me something to think about here locally that I can go right out to that I wouldn't have normally have done. So I appreciate that very much. Um, thank you all for joining us. Like I said, I, I plan to have a couple more of these coming up. Hope to have a, a, a fall fishing one in September. And if you have other ideas or interest, by all means, let me know on the website, uh, paflyfish.com. And happy to share more um, of some of these presentations with you. So again, thank you very much, everyone, and have a great evening. Thank you, Thanks guys. Thanks a lot, Dave. That was great. Thanks, Dave and Dave. Thanks, Dave and Dave. Sure. <laughs>